Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. I don't mean to. I was told to start speaking, so I will start speaking. Hi, guys. I'm back. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks for sticking around. It's, it's nice to still have a, a full audience here. How's everybody now? Are you all full of cosmology? Bursting on? Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So I'm going to continue where I, uh, where I stopped. And you will see that uh, Elisa's and my lectures are intertwined in a, in a very non-trivial way. Um, and she will have talked about some things that, um, that were maybe a bigger picture. And I'm going to take uh, a deeper dive into, into a few example details. So we're going to try and see if we can calculate some things uh, that, we, that we heard about. Um, and to do the calculations that I want to head towards, um, I have to start back from this picture. So this curve, you now see it, and you think freeze, uh, freeze out, right? Thermal relic freeze out. Um, and by the way, let me ask you a question, um, and there will be a reward if you, if you volunteer to give an answer. And I only have, unfortunately, seven of these. I, I was briefly contemplating buying 150, and then my, <laughs> and then my husband was, was practical and was like, yeah, no, we're not, we're not bringing 150 balls, stress ball, right? The universe stress ball. Um, so if, especially if you like, like fidgeting with things like I do, maybe you can volunteer to answer. Here's, so here's a question. Um, what does, so we know that the mass of dark matter particle is what decides where that roll off happens. What decides when the freeze out happens? What, what property of dark matter particle decides when that plateau is hit and how high that plateau is? Yeah. Don't, don't volunteer. <laughs> Although, okay, no. speak up. I think it's the, inter the interaction cross section. Mm -hmm. The interaction cross section. Okay, but now you have to catch it. If you drop it, then I'll have to. Yeah. All right. You deserve it. He's one of one of the uh, one of the organizers here. So thank you very much. Um, the cross section for the interaction. If the cross section is larger, how does this plateau change? Does it go up or down? The cross section is larger. Are you sure? Does it go up or down? Did I just throw you off real bad? <laughs> Anybody want to give me an argument? Yeah. yeah. It goes down because if, they, if it interacts more, then it takes longer for it to decouple because it needs to lose a lot more density. That's right. So if it interacts stronger, it'll stay in uh, contact with standard model particles for longer, and I'll lose more of it because I'll be annihilating for a longer time and I'll end up uh, with, a, with a relic density that's lower. So larger annihilation cross-section means you get less relic density. All right. Um, that deserves a ball, like I feel like. Also, I haven't been moving much today, so I'm just gonna... <laughs> So I feel like throwing things is, is, a good, is a good way to do this. All right, thank you very much. So here's a question for you guys. Get your cards ready. Okay, take a moment in silence. Read the question. I'm showing you four different, um, I guess, thermal histories, abundance histories. And I'm asking uh, which one of these four scenarios labeled A, B, C, D um, occurs if the Hubble rate is greater 
uh, then the interaction rate, while the temperature is much larger than the mass and the rest mass of the particle. Take a moment in silence, think about it. How does my abundance evolve if these conditions are met? Okay, do you need more time? I don't hear a resounding yes. So I'm gonna ask you to prepare your cards, wait for my mark. Oh, let's go on three. The back over there, Pre prepare your cards, everybody. Let's go on three. One, two, three. Oops. There are obstacles in these in this classroom. Okay. Complete rainbow of colors. I love it. Turn to your neighbor. Convince them that you're right. You have two minutes. Do you guys have questions? It's okay to ask me questions. The, the point is to confuse you and get you to ask questions. Catch me if you do. How's it going? No. Do you guys have any questions? No, I any question? Good. Yes, no question. Well, I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, but how is it? How would it be thoroughly produced? So, if, if there is an interaction. Right, it should just yeah. pop out of the bag at like really high. Remember, everything everything that's in a thermal bath, right, is yeah. is there. It's not like coming out of nowhere, right? It's there in the abundance set by the temperature of the universe and by the interaction the interaction rates and other properties of the particles. So you have everything in the equilibrium amount. That's what you start with, right? That's why with like most light particles. How's it going, guys? Do you have any questions? Any clarification that I can? So think about what does Hubble rate being larger than the interaction rate? What does that mean? What is what happens at that point? My, in in terms of microphysics. What stops happening? I was wondering about this because, but I don't know what's going on. I'm not trying to lurk. I'm just asking if you guys have any questions that I can clarify. Yeah. Like um, anything. So, okay. I mean, for D, is this, is this a case where like, this is, um, like the species that is that is being produced like from the decay of another particle, so it's coming out, and that's why it's interesting. It could be decay, it could be something else. Yeah, it could be some other interaction, but yeah, maybe like a conversion of one type of particle into another, maybe annihilation. Okay. And so is that framed by the gamma? Still the gamma being much less than H. So we're not the same, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we, all, we also have I think that that would be <laughs> because we don't have a drop either. I mean right. <laughs> <laughs> If you're, if you're so, so what what this. happens what happens when H becomes larger than the rate of an interaction? Uh, what? 
freeze out. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that interaction stops. Yeah. Right. So whatever is happening, if that occurs, whatever interaction is happening, if that occurs, you no longer have that interaction. Okay. So here I am. So at this point, you're already constant, right? Because it's already frozen out. That's it. It's, it's... Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's weird, right? It is. It is. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions that I can that I can help you clarify? Uh, you. <laughs> but but help me out. Tell me what you're struggling with. So I think if the condition is very high, just uh, some point we can introduce as the but um, and we don't think they're in having being too much space of that straight line. So so imagine that I don't have labels on the x-axis, right? So this could have this could be ambiguous question. So like one point of clarification is imagine that the mass of the particle is um large enough that it's like all the way to the left yeah. on this diagram. Very so on the problem. very left end of the diagram. Okay. And I'm saying at that point, make the Hubble rate faster than the rate of interactions. So which interactions I'm talking about here, let's say that those are like production or annihilation, like either direction of these interactions. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave you with that. Do you guys have any questions that I can help clarify? Yeah. <laughs> the first step is to figure out what the questions are, right? Yeah. So, uh, so one of the main things we're wondering is so that criterion of t being greater than m that basically refers to one side of this plot only then is far less. Greater than, okay. Yeah. Is already, I would say a, already then already is h then. grade. Yeah. Okay. So that's early. So then I think I don't want to hear the answer though. <laughs> I just wanted to help. I'm not gonna, yeah. So thank you. Any questions, guys? You're giving me the look. Yeah. <laughs> I'm terrified right now. Are <laughs> you terrified because you're terrifying me? So. Okay. I'm not gonna tell you yes or no. You you get to ask me questions right now. And the question cannot be what is the right answer. <laughs> Imagine that the mass is all the way on the left. M over T, unity is like on the far left of the stack. Does that give you needed information? Possibly? Okay. Take that. Do you guys have any questions that I can that I can help clarify? So, like, if this goes in, like, you feeling good about this? We better converse. Yeah. So this scale goes as n. Any questions? Over two third. Yeah. Over two third. I don't mean so I can also just okay, let you be. Divide, be. divide this by two to the third. This will this will be one, right? Okay. So then it would go as okay. two to the negative one. Okay. So I don't know what that looks like. Uh, just Desmos. <laughs> So, any questions here? Yeah, kind of the, the true one. How do you define oh, yeah. kind of yeah. the last part of it? Yeah, it's number density divided by, yeah, yeah, some moving number density. So we divide it out of yeah, the third. Okay. Do you guys have any clarify? Does it does it help to say that the mass over T unity on the far left of the graph? Does that help? M over T is one on the far left of that graph. Okay, so imagine that. It's three. Because I haven't told you where it happens. Imagine that the mass is heavy enough that it's on the far left of the graph. Oh. 
Any questions? You good? Okay. All right. Can you guys give me a moment? Of Hi. Hello. <clears throat> I heard some good discussions. Let's see. Let's see what the outcome is. Please prepare your voting cards. Dang it! Don't put them up yet. You know the rules. <laughs> All right. Let's go in three. One, two, three. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. So I see mostly green and green is B, that's the flat line and that's the correct answer. Okay, so the idea here was to say that you can imagine a scenario and you've heard of it by the name of warm dark matter, where dark matter doesn't stop being relativistic and that's why it decouples. It decouples for another reason, um, maybe it's cross-section, just have a weird temperature dependence. Maybe it's just really, really small. And that particle is still relativistic when it, you know, pieces out like the neutrinos. Okay. So this is the case of neutrinos where they just leave the thermal bath. They don't talk to photons anymore just because the weak force has that nature. Okay. Not because neutrinos became relativistic at that point. They have tiny masses. They were relativistic until fairly recently. Okay. So here's an example of neutrinos or another very warm uh, dark matter candidate. Right. This would be the scenario B. And you never get to suffer that Boltzmann suppression, um, but you, you freeze out while you're still relativistic. A lot of people got confused by the orange one. And the orange one is, is a, a thing that I'm not going to have time to talk about, but it's a whole different story. And it's one that's been like exciting uh, model builders. And by which I mean like particle physics model builders, not us cosmologists kind of like doing this effective thing um, and telling you all about it. Uh, but people who write Lagrangians down, like how does this thing interact? Where does it come from? What's the high energy physics of these things? Um, and that scenario is called a freeze-in. And you can imagine a, a situation where this particle um, that we call dark matter was never actually in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the universe, okay? Maybe the interactions that it has are just simply completely tiny. Um, and so it was like kind of leaking into the thermal bath through annihilation of some pairs of standard model particles, uh, but never so strongly that it would like maintain the temperature of the rest of the plasma, okay? And so you slowly build up that energy density, that number density of these particles. And that scenario looks like that orange freezing line in there. So people talk about freezing and just to throw some words there in case you read the papers um, in context, for example, of millicharged dark matter um, and other, um, other scenarios that may involve uh, dark photons, dark radiation and things like that, which I will not, not have the time to talk about right now. Okay, so great job on this. Thank you. Um, so in case of dark matter annihilation, um, what do I mean by this? So now I want to make this thermal relic um, be all of dark matter. Um, so now I'm talking about dark matter that's light enough uh, to affect the process of BBM. Because remember, that's where we started from long ago this morning. Um, and while I undergo this process of annihilation, I have to maintain entropy, right? So that's that. Um, that's where that quantity that we talked about that involves G star and the temperature and so on uh, remains constant throughout the annihilation process. Um, and as a consequence of that, if I'm annihilating, and this confused quite a few people, so I wanna go over that real quick. So if I'm annihilating, I lose on G star because I'm turning something relativistic, I'm turning a relativistic degree of freedom into something non-relativistic, okay? So G star drops. In the case of neutrinos, that's not exactly what happens. I'm just decoupling it. Uh, and my G star of the thermal bath reduces, but now I have a G star of this not coupled thing that's, that's still there and I still have to account for when I'm computing total entropy, okay? Did that last bit make sense? Or do people have questions about that? Okay. So G star will drop if I have dark matter that's fro that um, decoupled because it became non-relativistic and it's now annihilating. In that case, I heat the rest of the universe. 
Uh, in other words, I dump entropy into whatever particles this dark matter is annihilating into. It could be photons, maybe. Um, it could be neutrinos. It could be electrons and positrons that then annihilate into photons and so on. But at the end of the day, whatever uh, standard model annihilation channel I choose, I will one way or another tend to end up in radiation component. And so I end up uh, adding number density in radiation component and there, therefore heating up my radiation back. And then the funky thing happens, which is that there's like a giant hiccup in the universe. So the universe speeds up its expansion a little bit because now I like all of a sudden have uh, slightly heated up my radiation component. Um, and, you know, per Friedman equations. And if I speed up the expansion, what ends up happening is that I end up increasing YP. This is the mass fraction of primordial helium. So how much helium I produce. Um, in the early universe. So why do I end up increasing the helium fraction? Um, well, because I reach those temperatures for nucleosynthesis that like order 0.1 MeV or so when nuclei can start to stick together um, at an earlier time. It means I didn't lose out on as many neutrons, not, not as many of them decayed, had the time to decay if I cool down faster. Okay, does that make sense? So if I speed up the expansion, I cool down faster and I had less physical time for neutrons to decay so I can have more of them and build more helium. Okay. And neutron lifetime is about 15 minutes, um, just half-life. Uh, and so that's just kind of a number that's, that's maybe interesting to remember. All right. So if I have dark matter that'll do this. Oh, sorry. Question. Yes. So in the... In the previous slide, if, uh, ex if the universe is heated up, won't the uh, BVN happen at a router phase then? Uh, so there is a little, that's, that's right. So you have, okay. So there is, um, what you have to actually do is you have to take into account the increase in the temperature and how that affects all the nuclear interactions. Okay, so if you want to like um, compute the amount of helium that you get from a cosmology that's altered in this way, uh, this is only a part of the story. It's the most important part of the story, but there is a there is a piece that you're bringing up, which is that I I now have changed the temperature at, these, at which these interactions happen. And you're absolutely right. This will affect the process of BBN. It needs to be taken into account uh, for like a completely precise calculation. Okay. There's other things that can also happen. If I have more photons, I can also change by just the presence of more photons and the interactions that they undergo. I can also change the rates of other interactions that are happening in the plasma at that time. Good, okay. So this was a good catch, very good detail. All right, so if I have dark matter that does this, that starts to annihilate, sometime uh, during the BBN process in these first few minutes after the Big Bang, then that'll mess up the BBN process um, if dark matter is sufficiently light in the, if it transitions to non-relativistic at the right time, at the times when I'm building these nuclei. So you can think of this as BBN is just, is just uh, an event that occurred in the early universe whose consequences we can track today. We can measure the composition of the universe, right? So this is how I get a handle on what happened at those early times. And then, you know, at much, much, much later times, I'm also watching galaxies grow and structure form and things like that, okay? So BBN just gives us a handle on much earlier time in the dynamics of the universe at much earlier time through the measurements of primordial abundances of elements, okay? All right, now, here is, uh, here is the way that we usually quantify these changes. Uh, we talk about this parameter called the N-effective, the effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom. And it's usually defined in this way, and uh, that's shown here, where T gamma uh, is the temperature of the CMB uh, today, and then T nu is the temperature of neutrino-like species today. So the other radiation, all right? 
Uh, now, T gamma today, that's something we can measure. You know, we can stick a thermometer into the CMB. Like we've measured the temperature of CMB to high precision. We had no idea before we measured it how much radiation is there in the universe. So we couldn't tell how much radiation there was at BBN or how fast the universe would be expanding at that point in time unless we actually measure this temperature and then rewind the movie, right? So this is how we know the radiation content in photons in the universe throughout cosmic history. But neutrinos are trickier. Those guys, we can't really measure the temperature of uh, in the same direct way that we do uh, by, by like catching those particles. People are trying to do this. People are trying to detect uh, relic neutrino background. That would be awesome when that happens, but it's really, really hard to do. So what we do instead is we track the effects of that little bit of additional energy density in our universe that should be there because of neutrinos. And we track their effect on how the structures have grown throughout cosmic history. So you've heard about this from Joel on Monday about how thermal relics affect the structure growth. Um, and from galaxy surveys and from the CMB as well, we can back out what are the number of relativistic degrees of freedom that behave like neutrinos, okay? And we get three, which is so great. So like we have from the CMB alone even, we have a proof of the existence of at least three neutrino species, right? Not only have we seen these guys, you know, because we caught them in the detectors coming from the sun, uh, but also we've like, from cosmology, we know there is there is three, and then with some error bar. Okay, um, now particle species that don't decouple exactly when neutrinos decouple, that don't follow the path of neutrinos in this sense, may not contribute to an effect of a whole number. So even if there is a particle, dark matter particle um, that is sort of on the light side, let's say an MeV in mass will contribute to this N effective, but by a smaller amount than a neutrino that was fully relativistic when it decoupled, okay? Um, and by what amount will depend on, um, on what we assume about the temperature of these particles and, and their mass in particular. So when we talk about new physics, um, sometimes we like to break off this N effective, uh, you know, uh, comma W, uh, and this is, I think, notation that quite a few groups have, have adopted. But it was, this would be the N effective that you see in the standard model. So like, um, you know, standard model particles plus, um, you know, other, other um, standard neutrinos. And then this delta N over here would be like all of the rest of the stuff, light, dark matter, and maybe some exotic particles and things like that. So detecting dark matter, uh, mass in this way would amount to detecting the difference between what we expect the standard value of N effective to be um, above the error bar with which we measure the N effective. Okay, we haven't done that yet. So far, things are fairly consistent with just the three neutrino species. Uh, but we already know, as you've heard again on Monday, that pushing the error bar of N effective that we have right now, pushing it to lower, can start to reveal. Uh, the relative other relativistic degrees of freedom. There are many theories that will predict a detectable signature uh, in the N effective that we could see in the next few years, maybe a decade. All right, just one more thing that I want to show you. So here is the N effective that you get from um, from a thermal relic dark matter that um, is either a real scale or a complex scale or a Majorana Fermi and Dirac Fermi, like so a variety of things. This is what you should get from this, from this slide that fell out of equilibrium during BBN. Um, and the mass of the particle is shown on the x-axis and its contribution to this N effective is shown on the y-axis. Okay. I want you to notice that first two things. First, above about 10 MeV, there is no difference from the standard cosmology. So these are showing the difference from the N effective that we have in the standard model. So the normal neutrino species and nothing else. So the flat line out there converges to the three point whatever, uh, you know, the standard model value is, okay? So if that header is too heavy, it'll annihilate, but it'll do so before BBN even starts. It'll fall out of equilibrium 
at higher energies, at higher temperatures, and you just won't change anything in the BBN process. If it annihilates during BBN, that means that its mass has to be smaller than when the BBN starts to matter, when the interactions that affect BBN start to matter, which generously is around like 10 MeV or so. So inherently, the sensitivity of BBN is below that mass scale. Okay. That's the first feature I want you to notice. The second feature I want you to notice is some models will raise the number of effective degrees of freedom and some will lower them. How's that, how's that possible to lower them? How do you lower the number of effective degrees of freedom, relativistic degrees of freedom with a dark matter particle of let's say 10 kV, which would be the end over here on the left. How do you do that? Where do you want to go? I want to hear people from the back. I know you won't be comfortable there. Nobody's interrupting you, but I like to intrude like that. How do you lower? This ineffective. It's on the board. It's right there. It's in the equation. <laughs> Say it out loud. Higher photon temperature. That's right. All right. Cool. So, how would you make the temperature of photons higher? How do you make the temperature of photons higher? You annihilate into what? Hmm? Annihilation into what? So how do you make the temperature of photons higher to dark matter annihilation? What do you annihilate into? Hmm? Photons. I'll take that. Hmm? How do you how do you um, how do you make an effective higher instead of lower? You annihilate into what? You annihilate into neutrinos, right? So look at that equation. If I raise the temperature of photons, I will lower the number of effective degrees of freedom. Okay. What does that even mean? We measure the temperature of the photons today, right? It means that I started with the less of them, with less of energy density of the photons in BBN that I thought I did in the thermal bath. And the only reason I measure the temperature of the photons to be 2.73 Kelvin today is because I boosted them through annihilation of dark matter particles, okay? So you have to ponder that a little bit, like what's actually measured, what am, I, what am I changing and so forth. All right, so if I'm electromagnetically coupled, I may have annihilated into photons. So what I see in the temperature of the CMB today is a consequence of having the evolution and then having this kink due to dark matter annihilation, just like I did from electron positron annihilation, but there was another kink from dark matter. Uh, and I increase an effective if I'm coupled to neutrinos, because why not? I could annihilate into neutrinos, those are weird guys. They're, you know, almost a hidden sector, right? They're really, really hard to measure. All sorts of stuff could be happening in there. You can have dark matter coupled to neutrinos and boost their temperature. And that's how you increase the, the effective uh, number of degrees of freedom. All right. So here's just a description. I'll skip this slide. Um, I'll skip this plot um, for the sake of time. But uh, this is supposed to kind of more quantitatively give you a sense for the uh, for the change in the expansion history in the amount of time that it took to reach a certain temperature, depending on what dark matter mass is. Uh, but the take home here will be that if the mass of dark matter is between about 20 MeV and about 0.1 MeV, that's where you can mess with the BBN. So that's where BBN has sensitivity because that's the, those are the energies to which it happens. Um, okay, and here are the yields of helium that you get for a variety of dark matter models um, as a function of what you decide your dark matter mass to be. So notice one more time, if dark matter is really heavy, much heavier than 10 MeV, 
you just don't change the abundance of helium. You get the standard value. If it's lighter uh, than that, depending on what the mass is, you do end up boosting the helium abundance like we talked about a few minutes ago. And then here is just an illustration of the effects on the CMB. So you get this beautiful suppression of power at high multiples. And you can look for that in the cosmic microwave background, even from just the temperature anisotropy. You can also do it with polarization and so on. And here are some bounds uh, on uh, the amount of helium in our universe versus N effective uh, just for the CMB measurements. And you have a variety of CMB experiments. Uh, that's what different colors are showing. And then the lines that you see on there are theoretical lines uh, for where you need to live in this YP and effective parameter space. If you have, uh, on the one hand, dark matter coupled um, to electromagnetism, those will be the solid lines on the left, or if you have dark matter annihilating into neutrinos with the, the dashed lines on the right. In the middle is um, standard DDN at that star point. And as you move outwards along those lines, depending on the model you're interested in, you're decreasing the dark matter mass, okay? So wherever those theoretical lines are outside the 95 confidence interval for a given experiment, that's where this model of dark matter would produce CMB signals that are inconsistent with that measurement, okay? So you got to stay within the 95 confidence intervals and the best bound on these two parameters you get, when, of course, when you combine all the, all the data. So that's the, uh, that's the brown uh, ellipse that you see in there, okay? So all I'm left to do now is to show this very complicated summary plot, but I kind of wanted to put it there because it has all the information. So you can go back and kind of like scrutinize it on your own time. Uh, but the upshot is uh, the colored regions um, correspond to the range of masses that are allowed for a given measurement, okay? And the horizontal axis spans different measurements. And this analysis, uh, has included the measurements of the cosmic microwave background from various experiments. Uh, it even included forecasts for the Simons Observatory and CMBS4 experiment. And then YP and YD denote measurements of the primordial abundance is not from CMB, but from actually like intergalactic medium. So this is the, you know, those quasar spectral lines um, and then fitting them with like the abundance of helium or abundance of deuterium and so on. So those guys will also give you some information in addition to what we can learn from the CMB. So the upshot is right now we have a bound that's model dependent, lo and behold, right? Depends on which model you're interested in. That's the mass bound that you get. But you, what you will hear people say over and over again is that you can't have lighter than an MeV. And that's kind of the ballpark number you can keep in your mind. If you want a thermal relic that annihilated into stuff because it talked to the standard model in some way, then that guy cannot be lighter than about an MeV. So a thermal relic cannot be lighter than an MeV, roughly. Okay, do I have any questions here? You guys are holding up pretty well for how late it is and how many lectures you, you've heard so far. So I do appreciate it. Um, okay. I will show you one more slide then I'm gonna let you go for a good 10 minute break. Um, so people talk about dark matter annihilations and they talk about annihilations. And this is just a bound summary slide, okay? So listen for a moment and then you can parse the plot uh, later, yes. Quick question about the evolution of the temperature of the photon. How, what, like, how else can you constrain it? Because it seemed like you can, you know, play whatever game that you want and form whatever story for whatever dark matter model you have. Which yep. Yeah. A bit weird. So the question is, how else can we constrain the temperature of radiation at early times? Um, yeah. So you you have a few handles, right? Um, one handle is the BBN that results in different abundances that you can measure even today. And another handle is wherever you see structure 
wherever you see light tracers of like what the matter is doing, right? Um, and what the matter is doing will be affected by this bank background quantity, what N effective is, right? So what the overall expansion rate is. It'll also be true that the matter distribution will be affected by what kinds of particles are you trying to pack into those potential wells that are growing in the universe, right? So neutrinos themselves do contribute to the potential wealth in our universe, and we can see that effect. And this is one of the ways that we're hoping to measure their mass, okay? So we look at perturbations, we look at the structure growth, uh, and we look at that throughout cosmic history, wherever we can get a handle on that. Um, and at this point in time, you know, like, out to first galaxies in the future, we are hoping to do, you know, 21 centimeter um, line intensity surveys and things like that. And then also, if you put in a new thing into the universe, you got to deal with it, right? Like, so you can just like make up dark radiation. It's going to stick around unless it turns into something else, right? Like, so there's a whole set of consequences of like, what, what are you doing to radiation? And how does that change as, as you move, as you evolve the movie? But if you were to put error bars on the temperature of the universe as a function of redshift, you would have the strongest constraint at particular epochs of BBN and then later on when structure starts to form. Okay, so three words about annihilations, okay? So some of you may be now going like, well, I heard about indirect detection and detecting dark matter annihilations. What's up with that? Because there are annihilations in this story of like thermal relic and so on, right? Um, and what's up with that is that we imagine that, you know, if dark matter is coupled to standard model and it's a thermal relic, okay? It could still have some amount of residual annihilations going on today, wherever you have lots of dark matter so the dark matter particles can slam into each other. Okay, so overall on average in the universe, this interaction has shut off because of the expansion, but in the centers of galaxies, maybe you can see a signal maybe annihilation even into photons, maybe other channels, uh, but this could be happening today. Karim is signaling me, that, okay, do you want to give me the, <laughs> I don't know, like I don't have, um, I'm getting signals over there from my student that I'm running out of battery uh, in more ways than one, but um, yeah, I don't have my charger here. I'll figure it out in a minute. So, uh, so we look for annihilations in galaxies, and uh, there are ways, I will close with this, there are ways to avoid these bounds from annihilations that we see, or rather from a bound on an annihilation that we don't see in the centers of galaxies um, and still have a thermal relic particle, but you have to do some, some serious model building to do that kind of thing, okay? So this is another handle towards the same physics that we play with when we talk about a thermal relic as well. Okay, I'll stop there and I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Thank you. No. Nope. <laughs> Mark, why, what is the email that you sent us?
So that's why it was new to. Okay. Wow, that's loud. Sorry. <laughs> Scared myself. Okay. Can you guys hear me in the back if I talk like this? Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, for the last bit, I want to talk about the interactions uh, of dark matter. How do we probe? How do we look for interactions of dark matter in the more local universe? Um, and in particular, thank you. I have to share my screen, I've been told, so. So the question is, how do we look? But is that, am I sharing? What, what am I sharing? How do I have presenters view here? Is this a mystery to you? This is a mystery to me. They don't see the presenters view or? Well, maybe if you exit and enter again, the full screen. Yeah. Try to let me first. Let me first go into the first screen. Then, yeah, it's not sharing on the film, it gets stopped wherever it is. Yeah, but I don't know if I can share it now. Oh. Sorry, guys. I'm trying. <laughs> Not showing. You give it a try to exit and then you share. Share the, first and the, then. The slide first. Okay. Then okay. I will try again sharing from the projector. Oh, there we go. That should work too. Oh, this is working. Yeah, well, it's beautiful. Oh, uh, maybe you can try to hide that. Again, I, I, I don't have. Oh, oh don't have it. Good. Here and then. Perfect. Perfect. All right. See, this is why he got the ball first. <laughs> this is exactly why. All right. Um, thank you. All right. So I want to talk a little bit in the time that I have left about uh, how do we look for interactions of dark matter with baryons, with normal matter in the universe today. And the first thought that should come up in your minds is this is like direct detection, but in cosmological context, right? So we're looking for um, elastic scattering between dark matter and standard models of these arrows uh, on the left going up. Um, so you all have, uh, you know, heard about baryonic acoustic oscillations, which is like this system here. Uh, right, where you have the potential wells, uh, and then you also have uh, the elasticity of the spring, which is like the pressure of the radiation that photons, that baryons are coupled to. If you add interactions between baryons and dark matter, you're now coupling two fluids that are normally not coupled, coupled in standard cosmology. So that's like dunking the system into a bucket of water and damping those oscillations because you will exert a drag that baryons will now feel, a drag force that comes from them scattering with dark matter particles. And dark matter particles, as you know, just wanted to fall into the gravitational potential wells and grow perturbations in standard cosmology. Now, I showed you this video um, where I showed the, the growth of dark matter perturbations in the linear regime, so in the early universe. Um, and you saw that boring video of just like the spikes were just getting bigger. Uh, here's what happens when you couple this dark matter to baryons. Right? So dark matter itself undergoes acoustic oscillations until those interactions decouple in some way. And this is a video made uh, by one of our students uh, who modified the class code, this real space interface, um, to kind of visualize what happens in these interacting cosmologies. So now you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to be skipping a few slides. So when I tell you close your eyes, you close your eyes, and I go ahead a few slides. Deal? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to do a quicker review um, of how do we describe dark matter baryon interactions in context of cosmology. 
So in particle physics, what you would do is you would first ask a question, okay, so am I doing like collider physics and like things are happening at high energies or am I doing some sort of effective theory where I just want to capture what happens at low energies? And the latter, the low energies is what's important for cosmology as it turns out. So for most part, for the most part, um, when we talk about the effect of dark matter physics on cosmological perturbations, on where, how matter is distributed in our universe, uh, we're okay to stay with the realm of effective theory, more or less, okay? So that's what we're gonna do for right now. And in that case, what I would do if I was a model builder in particle physics, I would write some interaction operators, uh, assume maybe that, that my dark matter is a fermion and ask what are all the ways that I can couple it to a proton, let's say. Um, and maybe I'll have interactions that look like Coulomb force. Maybe I'll have interactions that uh, look like uh, scattering of an electric dipole or a magnetic dipole. Uh, or maybe I'll have like billiard ball scattering, like velocity independent hard sphere scattering and so forth. For a cosmologist, all of these different scenarios will boil down to a power law dependence of momentum transfer interaction cross section. So the cross-section that controls how fast momentum is transferred between dark matter and baryons. Okay, that's that sigma and t, cross-section for momentum transfer, is a power law of the relative particle velocity. Okay, and that's all that there is to it. Nothing funky, no, no crazy functions there. It's just the velocity to some power. Okay, and if you have velocity independent interactions, that power n will be zero, and you end up with like a number for all times, okay? That velocity independent scattering is exactly the physics that we're looking for in direct ejection experiments, okay? So the exact same story of the hard ball scattering is what we've been looking for when we were looking for the WIMP. But the beauty of cosmology is that we can actually not constrain ourselves to looking for these weakly interacting particles but we can unlock other paradigms. Many of the paradigms that I showed uh, on that Venn diagram at the beginning um, that maybe entail particles that would be too light to be seen in direct detection experiments. So sub GeV particles. And this has been an area of, of active research uh, in maybe the past decade or so. Now, if you have momentum transfer, depending on how that transfer depends on relative particle velocities, uh, you will have different evolution of the momentum transfer rate that's shown in the graph here as a function of redshift. Okay, so think about it for a moment. Relative particle velocities for most of cosmic history are sourced by thermal velocities. Okay, so how hot dark matter is, how hot baryons are, that gives you a sense of what the relative particle velocities are. Until structures become nonlinear, things start to fall into big potential wells, and then that story gets a little more complicated. But for the most part, uh, velocity dependence tells me which one of the curves up there, how quickly are they rising or falling as a function of redshift? Which ones should I pick? So that's my choice of dark matter model. If I'm a cosmologist, that, that'll suffice. Okay, and I don't have to tell you to close your eyes because I can totally skip slides in the presenter view and that makes me really happy on a Friday afternoon. Okay, so I'm gonna just show you what, um, how you would change the C and B temperature and isotropy power spectrum if you add interactions between dark matter and protons, that's velocity independent. So again, same story as for uh, direct ejection. So this, uh, for the blue curve here, I've ramped up the interactions to be something like a hundred times uh, stronger than what the C and B will allow. Okay, so it's a suppression of power with a characteristic shape. So this is something we can look for um, in cosmological data. And uh, these are the equations behind the whole story. So I don't want you to unpack all of these equations. I just want you to take note that interactions will alter my Boltzmann equations. So that set of equations on the bottom uh, that maybe you've seen before, if you haven't, they're great references to understand um, how you derive these Boltzmann equations. That's the guts of the class code and the CAM code that, that I was mentioning earlier. Um, the class and CAM will solve those system of equations and tell me what the perturbations look like at different points in cosmic history. And then in addition, if I couple two fluids, I will also exchange heat between them, right? 
So now I'm putting in thermal contact my cold dark matter uh, with baryons and through them with photons as well. And maybe I heat up my dark matter through these interactions at some point in cosmic history. So these are the kinds of, um, this is like the, the background of all the story of what the observables look like. Um, and uh, the bottom line is, uh, like I said here, I'm just going to go back this one slide. Um, the bottom line is that the interactions will typically uh, suppress power um, in all the tracers of matter uh, on small scales progressively more and more. And this occurs because of the damping of those, uh, of those oscillations. And it also occurs because dark matter perturbations will now start to partially feel that pressure from radiation. So they won't be as efficient in clustering as they were if they were just cold and left to themselves. Okay, so I suppress power on small scales. So here's a, um, the current, I guess like close to the current state of the art of the measurement of the matter power spectrum. Uh, in our universe. And these data points were inferred from a variety of observations. And so what I want you to notice here is that the CMBs on the far left of that diagram, large scales, that's what you get if you, if you look at the CMB only, because you know it's far away. <laughs> we only capture the largest scales. Um, and if you want to get at those really small scales on the far right, uh, you got to look at more local stuff at least galaxy surveys, but ideally maybe even substructure in the Milky Way. And if I have time, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so you can look um, for suppression of power with either tracers or small on, or large scales. Okay, so here's maybe the last uh, question for you guys. And this is gonna be maybe an easy one, maybe, or like terribly confusing one. We'll see which one it is. Ooh. One is CDM, the other one is CDM plus the interactions. Which one? Don't raise the card. Wait, said, Take a moment. You can see the whole evolution. So better power spectrum. The old guard over here is probably like got it already. But you so our spectrum is less. Yeah, but that's oh, the point. So when you show this in a physics colloquium, you can tell oh, the small just star in the audience. Uh, in this space. The power spectrum is fast, just means the variance is slower. So it's more smooth. Okay, let's go three folks. Which one has dark matter baryon scattering? One, two, three, go. All right, so look around. Look around. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. All right. So why? Why B? Because it's smoother, less clumpy. Okay. Less structure and small scale. If you're not used to it and you had it wrong this time around, it's okay. This, but this is like you will you will walk away with this knowledge for sure by the time you end your PhD. Uh, you look for structure in things because that's what we do. Okay. So this one's smoother. And by the way. This is tremendously smooth, like way, way smoother than the CMB is allowed to be. Like if I showed you uh, the difference at the level of the CMB bounds that we have, which I'm going to show you here are the bounds for a variety of models um, that we have right now, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart with a naked eye, right? So we actually do like detailed analysis um, and we, we derive these bounds. Okay, so a variety of bounds, what do these bounds mean? Um, if I translate them in a simple language, what they mean is that from the CMB alone, we know that when the universe is about a thousand years old, less than one in a hundred thousand scatterings that every proton experienced, okay, but things were interacting a lot at that time. So less than one in a hundred thousand interactions could have been with dark matter without us seeing it, seeing evidence of it in the CMB. And the other thing I want you to notice, look at the mass scale. It's MEVs all the way down to like KV scale, right? Nothing stops us in cosmology from looking at light dark matter as well. Okay, but if we wanna do better than the CMB, we can. And as um, Elisa was, was telling you earlier today, to do better 
typically, and here's one big take home from this dark matter story, typically you have to look at smaller scales, okay? So here is a snow mass uh, summary plot from the Cosmic Frontier uh, Working Group report. And that plot shows you a couple of things. First, the different colors represent the matter power spectrum for different dark matter models. Look at that variety, right? Um, you have uh, warm dark matter, that's the black line, the smooth black line. You have fuzzy dark matter, that's the, that's the magenta one over here. You have interacting dark matter, like the stuff that I was just talking about, with those dark acoustic oscillation bumps. Then you have what I like to call sticky axions, axions that have self-interaction, so that you get this enhancement of power um, and many other things. That's the first take home. Second take home, it all happens on small scales. Okay. Why? Because smaller scales will enter cosmological horizon earlier and probe physics at higher energies. Typically, that's where you can pack new physics. Okay. So typically, you want to get a handle on smaller scales if you want to get at dark matter microphysics with observations. Third take home, the data points are on large scales, okay? Because small scales are difficult to measure. That's one thing. Um, but also they're polluted by those pesky baryons. That's the other thing. Um, and then the third thing is they're nonlinear. These are galaxies and subgalactic scales that we're talking about. So they're difficult to use um, in the way that we're used to using the CMB to do this statistical analysis of what the you know, distribution of matter in the universe looks like and so on. So those are difficult to model, they're difficult to measure, but that's the name of the game. This is where we're going with all of these new surveys um, and all these pushes to, um, to really get at the microphysics of dark matter uh, with cosmic structures. Okay, um, so let me see where I want to go. Okay, I want to talk for a little bit about the damping of the matter power spectrum, about that suppression of the matter power spectrum and where it comes from and why. And in doing so, I want to touch on two paradigms. One is this warm dark matter that we've been talking about over and over again. And I hate the term warm because it's not all about the temperature at all. Um, and I'll tell you why and how you, you may want to think about it. Um, and I also want to touch on this interacting dark matter, so dark matter that exchanges momentum and, and heat with baryons. In the case of warm dark matter, and I put a bunch of references there for further reading, and that's my biased view of like, you know, maybe somewhat illuminating papers, but there's tons more as well. So in the case of warm dark matter, what happens uh, while you end up with this cutoff in the matter power spectrum uh, that we were, you know, a bunch of us were showing throughout this week, is because dark matter decouples while it's still at least partially relativistic. And so it free streams out of gravitational potential wells. It doesn't really clump well until it stops being relativistic, which depends on its mass, okay? So if you decouple as a relativistic particle, and that happens to be at the time when the modes we can observe enter cosmological horizon, you will suppress those modes. You will smooth the universe out on those scales because you're too fast and not possible to pack into gravitational potential wells. That's non-collisional damping. That's the free streaming of warm dark matter. If you're interacting dark matter, you damp the power spectrum for a slightly different reason. You damp the power spectrum because you're exchanging momentum with baryons which at the time when these small modes are entering cosmological horizon um, are tightly coupled to photons, and so they won't let you clump, okay? So you smooth out the universe due to collisional damping. So slightly different physics, but the outcome looks very, very similar. So notice these three different curves correspond to three different warm dark matter masses. As you ma make dark matter warmer, so you make it last longer as a relativistic or semi-relativistic species, so it's lighter, okay? You push that cutoff to larger scales. You make that free streaming cause damping last longer. 
Okay, so you have you suppress larger and larger modes. And if you make dark matter interact more and more, uh, you do the same. So you're increasing the cross section for collisional damping moves this cut off to the left. Okay. So let's talk for a few minutes about warm dark matter. So what people mean by warm dark matter is a thermal relic warm dark matter that decouples while still semi-relativistic so that inherit, it inherits appreciable velocity dispersion from early times, just like neutrinos. Okay? That's exactly what neutrinos do. And then here is a way you can estimate, and this is an estimate, this is not the exact calculation. Again, pick up your favorite textbook to get this number more correctly or use class or cam to actually calculate these power spectra. Um, but the free streaming length, how far has this particle been able to travel since it started free streaming, okay, since it decoupled at some early time, all the way until it became non-relativistic, so it slowed down, okay, it slowed down significantly. This is how far it traveled. And C is there instead of the velocity because I'm making a crude assumption that while it's semi-relativistic, it just travels with the, with the speed of light. Okay, I'm not going to even bother modeling the velocity exactly. Okay, so this calculation um, will tell me, because of the bound on, uh, on when it becomes non-relativistic, that's a function of, of the particle mass, right? That'll tell me where this cutoff will happen, at what scale. And of course, uh, this is what uh, a simulations of a CDM uh, dark matter halo with all of its subhalos, Milky Way like uh, halo with all of its subhalos looks like. Um, and I'm going to ask you, maybe I can ask you which one's warm and which one's cold. Hmm? The right one is warm, yes. And I just have to get rid of the balls. So I'm just going to give it to you. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Yes, the right one's warm, less structure, less of those subhales. Okay, so from measuring the population of galaxies that would inhabit that substructure, those small subhalos, um, and matching it to these simulations, we can figure out how much suppression uh, could have possibly could there have possibly been in this linear matter power spectrum. So, in other words, what is the scale out to which at least I must have CDM? in order to see all the small galaxies, uh, like the satellites of the Milky Way that I do see today, okay? And it turns out that from the ES survey um, and 10 stars and from classical satellites that we knew about from SDSS uh, and before, uh, we can put a lower uh, bound on the warm dark matter mass of about 6.5 keV. Okay? Again, notice that this is for a thermal relic. So I'm assuming the production mechanism here. And the free streaming length in that case has to be less uh, than about 10 kiloparsecs. Okay, quick pause. Any questions there? Yes. So, uh, to form a substructure of subhead with small size, so the mass of the warm dark matter should be greater than 6.5 kV? Should be greater than 6.5 kV. That's right. To form all the satellites that we see around the Milky Way today. By the way, um, there has been this missing satellite problem for a long time. I don't know how updated folks are on this. I realize this could be a whole other lecture. But these days, we're pretty convinced as a community that they're not really missing satellites. We think there is, once we actually accounted for the fact that we didn't see a lot of them because of observational biases, and for the fact that, uh, you know, we needed to simulate very carefully Milky Way halo with its large Magellanic cloud and so forth. And we needed to understand the relationship between galaxies and their underlying halos. When we took all of that into account, we now realize that, that the number of satellites that we see is what roughly we should have seen uh, in, in CDM, okay? But the trick is that we can only see down to a certain mass, and that means mapping this power spectrum down to a certain scale and not lower than that. Okay, uh, for the last uh, tiny bit, 
uh, of the story that I wanted to tell you was just to cover this interacting dark matter story. Um, so assuming elastic scattering at some point in cosmic history, um, you actually end up having this collisional damping that I was uh, that I was talking about. And because I feel the weight of a Friday in a very, very rich summer school, I'm going to just say I did prepare an exercise for you guys, <laughs> which is totally going to take you half an hour, but it's a whole research project. Okay. Feel free to check it out. It's in my slides. Uh, the solution uh, is this. Okay. It's this, it's going to be this paper. So I was going to make you compute the bound. It's totally possible analytically and analytics works so well. It's amazing. This is one of the, like this project was like one of the most enjoyable ones that I've ever done because analytical estimate was like almost right on with the bound that we got from a very complicated analysis. And I, I guarantee you, you can do it in maybe like an hour if you follow the steps that I described there. So if you want to do that, do it. Um, but here is the bound on the interaction cross-section that we get um, as a function of dark matter particle mass. So the same figure like those that you see from direct ejection, okay? If we um, take into account the fact that we see satellite galaxies representative of CDM down to a mass of about 10 to the 8 solar masses or so. So this is much smaller than the large Magellanic cloud. We see maybe a little bit less than 100 of them. And that um, means consistency with CDM. And it means that collisions could not have erased structure on the underlying scales that these satellites arose from. Um, and uh, if you squint over there, you'll see that green line, that's the C and B bound. Those are the previous bounds that I was telling you about. So if you want to go after dark matter microphysics, going with small scales is, is a really powerful way to go. And then the challenges are many um, in doing that. Um, and I'm going to skip over to the conclusion uh, on that. So challenges are many. You have to deal with smaller um, halos that host fainter galaxies. So you won't see all of them. You need to understand how many of them should you have seen, given the survey properties that you're dealing with. Um, and you need to understand baryonic physics um, and structure formation and galaxy halo connection. You may need to run simulations to do all of this. So it's it's a borderline, like it's, it's getting out there where analytic theory doesn't really help a whole lot. Um, and then you have to do all of that in context of fast forward modeling to be able to sample your parameter space, which is like a crazy difficult problem to do. Because remember, we run simulations to just produce one halo and so on. Uh, but that's where the field is, is headed. It's the field of near field cosmology where we're trying to learn uh, properties of the constituents of our universe from small scale structures in our, in our neighborhood, basically. Okay. I'm going to conclude here and um, just say that, you know, this is what we see in the night sky, more or less. I'm not an artist, um, but hopefully you can, you know, squint. And this, but I was pretty proud of myself for doing this. Like, <laughs> and this is what we're trying to get at, right? It's a hard problem. There's tons of possibilities out there. Um, and finding clever ways to look for things we weren't able to look for before, finding clever ways to make our computational tools efficient enough so that we can do what we've been doing in CMB analysis and so on uh, with these galaxy data uh, is, is kind of like where the field is going, at least in this particular aspect. Um, all right. Pointing you to my key points, I wanted to cover a lot more, of course, because uh, that's that's what professors do, um, always want to cover three times as much. Uh, but I have one more minute, so I will show you this. Uh, so you all are you know, either getting your PhDs or doing your postdocs. So where's the field headed in the coming years? We've all told you about all the open questions that are out there, but some things will actually be answered. And they will be answered in the span of a decade. And I kind of asked help from all the lecturers to put together this slide, uh, but all the guilt is on me if I have omitted things or written them wrongly. So just a disclaimer there. Uh, but one of the things that we know we will measure in the coming decade, we're really going after it, and we're designing our experiments to do it, is the sum of the neutrino masses. This is something that we have very little hope that we will do from lab experiments. And this is what, like, you know, the particle community is looking towards the uh, cosmologists to do. OK, 
Okay, we just need to convince them that our measurements are robust, and that's going to be the tough, uh, tough task. But we have designed a lot of experiments with that purpose in mind. Um, we're probably going to start detecting uh, the minimum mass of halos, of subhalos, that are able to host galaxies. There's a cutoff on how massive the halo has to be in order to even have a galaxy within it so we can see it. Um, we're probably going to reach that limit uh, with Rubin. Uh, and then we're going to go after large scale B modes with the CMB experiments. And there may be some, uh, some surprises there too. Um, in addition to those measurements, we are designing our analysis and our experiments to really stress test these cosmological tensions that you guys heard about. So there's going to be some hope is there's going to be some final words uh, on, on the tensions. At least the S8, we feel like is, you know, something we can maybe try and resolve. Um, we are going very aggressively after the dark energy equation of states. So we really want to know what dark energy is. Hopefully it's not boring. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of effort going into understanding what the growth looks like and all these galaxy surveys are going to tell us something about this. Um, the hope is also to test GR and learn a ton about structure formation in the regimes uh, that we didn't probe before. So like I said before, JWST is looking at the very first galaxies. This is a rich data set. If you haven't been following, I suggest reading a couple of papers and understanding what people are thinking about in that regime as well, because when we want to do cosmology, we've got to deal with those galaxies in those baryons. And then there are some uh, large open spaces that will be open in the coming surveys. Uh, one of these large open spaces for potential discoveries is pushing on that and effective, getting a better handle on light relics. Things might pop out there. We're going to get significantly more sensitivity. That's always, uh, that's always exciting. Same story with small scale dark metaphysics. Again, with a sur surveys of the local universe in near field cosmology. Uh, first galaxies. And then I guess I have to say it even though we didn't really devote too much attention to it, the black holes and neutron stars, stars through gravitational waves, also a very exciting area of research in a whole new, whole new world. Okay, I vote for B here, um, and I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, guys. Before we finish, a big hand for the organizers of the school. This was awesome. Thank you so much. I can. This is for you. You can put it down. You want to take a question? I can take questions if, if people have it in that. Yeah, also. Uh, yeah. Maybe questions after, like if you want, yeah, I'll be here. So let so. me um, uh, get, um, please, uh, make a few announcements. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask Vera if we are going to vote A, B, C, D on those discoveries. I guess not. So next time. <laughs> hey, so uh, before I forget a couple of things. First of all, soccer game happening soon or for soccer players on the random channel. Yep, soccer. Uh, Top of the Park Summer Festival in another well-known summer festival called Top of the Park. It's two week long and I was told it starts tonight. I was out of the loop. So if you're interested, that's cool. You can relax on the lawn, listen to some music. Um, uh, there are locals who know more about it. Uh, in other news, I wanted to thank, to thank a few people without whom this would be completely impossible. Uh, Otavio, who I see, raise your hand, Otavio, to we see you, Otavio. Audiovisual and Tianke, where is Tianke? Tianke also, yes. Without Otavio and Tianke, this would have been not functional. Uh, as well as Karen, who is not here, who many of you communicated with our administrative assistant. Um, extremely helpful. Thank you all so much for coming. Hope to see you again. Have a good trip. Have a good soccer game. See you again. Thank you.